Well, hello, everybody. Uh, welcome back to another PACE webinar. We have Organizational Excellence Part 2, including real-time uh, assessment results today. Uh, it's, it's my great pleasure to have Dawn Ringrose uh, back leading the discussion. And she's the principal of Organizational uh, Excellence Specialist. So it's, it's great to have someone who's so well-versed in this field to uh, continue our discussion of organizational ex excellence is something we're certainly uh, very interested in here at PACE. Uh, and that, without further ado, Dawn, please take it away. Thank you very much, Rafe. Um, pleased to be here once again. Last session, we talked about organizational excellence and took a look at the global results on a very unique un uh, research study that we've been doing on the current state of organizational excellence by size, industry, sector, and region of the world. And since then, we've done this uh, special research study with, uh, with PACE members to try to take a look at real-time results. And so this is what I'm gonna talk about today. So I'll just work here to share my screen. And is that coming up okay? Yeah. Good. And I just want to make sure that as I advance the slides, there uh, it's advancing because sometimes these looks, looks good. Looks oh, good. 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 I thought I'd just do a little test drive there. Thank you very much for that feedback. Okay. So first of all, I'd like to. We're kind of taking a look at the guest list and. We've got people from all sorts of different uh, different countries, and we may have some guests that um, that just took advantage of the link and uh, of, have uh, popped in uh, without uh, registration. So I'm kind of I'm very curious about what countries we have represented here today. So please just chat, uh, put in the chat where you're from. Myself, I'm uh, I'm on Vancouver Island on the west coast of of Canada. And it's a lovely day here. We've got uh, lots of greenery and warm temperatures. It's a time of year where we're busy planting our gardens. <laughs> Maybe I'll move. I'll move on to the the presentation. We're gonna today take a look at this integrated excellence model that we've been using to do research and the automated assessment tool that we have. Uh, give you a little bit of background on that, and then we're going to sit back and appreciate the real time results. Uh, and, uh, and and just have a good discussion about them. Uh, these are different when you do aggregate results versus an individual organization results, but it gives you a general feel about um, how we interpret the results and and the what next uh, sort of actions that uh, organizations can take. We're also going to talk about how these results can be leveraged by the PACE members and uh, just talk very briefly about how improving organizational performance can contribute to your local economy, trade and resident quality of life. So it's a it's a pretty important topic and like to open it up to questions that people have, of course, and any discussion about the results uh, at, uh, as we go through or at the end so that uh, you get all your questions answered. So first of all, we'll talk about the excellence model and the assessment tool that has been, been used for the study. And uh, I want to just say a few words about excellence models. You know, they've been around, first developed back in the late 80s, early 90s. And you might have heard about EFQM, Baldridge, the Canadian model, the Australian model. And those were the first models to came, come on the scene. And they were based on research done with high performing organizations. And what characteristics did they have in common? And these characteristics were defined and these models were then available for organizations to consider using uh, to make sure that ha they had these best management practices in place. And what we found over the decades is that when organizations implement these best management practices that are common to high performing organizations, they, they develop a culture that's really committed to excellence where the employees are always asking, what are we doing now and how can we do it better? And uh, the organization is working towards achieving exceptional results. You know, they've got a balanced system of measurement. And those exceptional results are things like good governance, um, 
you know, leader, trust in leadership, delighted customers, engaged employees, um, and so on. So it's a, it's a formula. I kind of like to call it the formula for success because it is uh, tried and true. And there's a lot of great research studies that have been done that uh, validate uh, the return on investment. Here's the organizational excellence framework. You know, back in about 2010, I had been doing work in this area since um, 1990, appreciating all the frameworks and, uh, and the research that had been done. But I thought there was an opportunity to put everything in one place because there were unique features in some of the, the frameworks and I wanted to pull it all together in one place. So all those principles that describe the culture, all the practices that uh, are, are being used across key management areas. And then what I did was I wrote a publication that also added implementation guidelines because this was the most frequently asked question that I ever received was, well, how do you do this or how do you do that? And so this publication is available for download at no charge on the homepage of, uh, of uh, my business website. The automated assessment tool asks uh, respondents to take a look at these principles and take a look at these practices and provide a rating about the extent to which they're in place in their organization. And when we take a look at the principles, uh, we use kind of a you know subjective rating scale, that gut feel that uh, a respondent might have, the extent to which that principle is really part of their culture and it's a low, low, medium, 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 high and high rating. So that, that is a sort of scale that's being used there. But on the practices across the key management areas, it's a much more objective scale. And respondents are considering um, the extent to which this practice, uh, they're using a good approach with regards to this practice. Um, the extent to which it's deployed across the organization. Are they getting good results? Do they have a continuous improvement mindset, you know, and, and so they're taking, you know, a, a much different look at that uh, each practice and the extent to which it's in place in the organization. And uh, we take a look at the, the scale there is uh, indicates whether the organization is just beginning off to a good start doing well or, or high performance. And uh, we'll take a, a look at the results from that perspective. So the real-time assessment results, this is as exciting. It's always exciting for me to do this and take a look at, at how groups are doing. Um, in this particular instance, we worked really hard to get some respondents in, but we only had 10 organizations uh, represented. Uh, and But that's okay. It's just that I caution as we look at the results that this is not a statistically significant sample. And so please do keep that in, in mind. You know, if, if you took a look at all the, all the members that, that PACE has, you know, we'd want to have 10 to 15% at least represented here uh, to make you know, any conclusions. Uh, but uh, this is uh, what we're going to look at today is for these 10 organizations, we had six industry sectors represented primarily respondents from the business sector, service sector, um, from leadership and to a certain extent management, um, and mostly from micro-sized organizations, you know, followed by medium. And uh, the sectors that were, if we take a look at specific industry sector, we see the sectors that are represented here and we see that, uh, you know, most of the respondents from, were from the professional scientific and technical sector and from different countries. So this is lovely to take a look at, at the re, kind of the respondents from this perspective too. And most of the respondents are from uh, India and the United States. So the full assessment and the aggregate ratings on the full assessment, it tells us the degree to which the culture is committed to excellence in the organization and the degree to which the best management practices have been deployed basically. And if we start with the principles, there's nine principles that describe the culture that's committed to excellence. And I might say that, um, you know, as we take a look at the aggregate results, please keep in mind that really high performing organizations are, are they've got ratings 
in, in the principles of 7.5 and above. Uh, and, um, and similarly, as we take a look at the practices, you know, those ratings are, are in a similar, um, you know, part of the rating scale. Uh, and a lot of uh, organizations that earn national excellence awards are, are coming in at, you know, six or above. So that just gives you an idea of the scale. Um, but here's the, the results on the principles was very interesting. Um, the scores were really quite high and overall average on the, on the principles was 5.8. And we see the highest rating on leadership involvement and the lowest on societal commitment, uh, which was interesting. Usually on societal commitment, of course, we think the nonprofit sector or the government sector rates, you know, pretty high on that a particular item, but these respondents are mostly from business. And so that's something that organizations might want to take a look at in, in terms of how they, they might um, perform a, a, a little bit better. And in the framework, we've identified all the practices that are directly related uh, to each of these principles. So if an organization has, let's say, a lower score on one of the principles, they want to look at their scores on the directly related best management practices uh, with a view to, okay, this is how we're going to strengthen this item. And here's one of the comments from one of the respondents from uh, South Africa, and, and they're talking about uh, decisions taken, our data-based leadership promoting and supporting continuous improvement initiatives, and the, the opportunity that they see in governance on how they can perform a little bit better. So it's always interesting to take a look at the comments because they really give the rationale for the ratings. And I, I think the comments are just gold uh, because they tell us so much about the organization, especially if we're doing an assessment with a particular organization and we're inviting all of the employees to weigh in. You get so much information about that organization. It's, it's really valuable going forward in, in terms of you know, building on your strengths and addressing your opportunities for improvement. And so overall, if we take a look at the, how the PACE members compared to, to the world aggregate ratings, uh, we, we see it's, it's pretty even. Um, they're, you know, keeping up uh, and in some, on some of the principles, you know, a little, little higher and some of the principles uh, a little bit uh, lower, but um, they're holding, holding, uh, up well with regards to the world aggregate ratings. Now for the key management areas, we've got nine key management areas. And within these areas, we've got quite a number of best management practices for micro size organizations, there's 51. Uh, and for larger organizations that have 26 or more employees, there's 102. So this really dives down deep into the organization and gives respondents a a chance to consider what they're doing or not doing. And they also, in doing that, reflect on some of the issues their organizations are having and what might be, you know, related. So root cause and uh, how they might strengthen their organizations in respect. And uh, it's it's just an experience in itself going through the assessment because a lot of, a lot of respondents will get these open-ended comments that, oh, this is why we're so adrift or, or this is why we're having this uh, issue uh, or else this kind of helps reinforce, you know, what, why their performance is, is quite good. So it's a real experience in itself taking the time to do one of these assessments. So these are the ratings, uh, aggregate ratings for the 10 respondents across these key management areas. And you can see that the ratings have dropped quite a bit compared to the principles. And uh, this is what we find in the global assessment too, is that there's a significant difference between aggregate ratings on the principles and the key management areas. There's usually about a point difference, but with this particular group, there was, was a more pronounced difference. Do you know? And, uh, but that's, that's fine. I mean, each organization is unique. We have to take that into consideration and we might see much different results if we had a much larger sample size. So here we're, we're taking a look at, um, you know, organizations and whether they're just beginning kind of the zero to 2.5 range, if they're off to a good start, 2.6 to 5, 
doing well, 5.1 to 7.5, and high performance, 7.6 to 10. And we can see that um, the key management areas, you know, most of these ratings are in the just beginning area. And there's uh, a, a few that are in the um, good start range. And um, the overall average rating on the key management areas was 2.5. Uh, so quite a bit lower than the principles, which averaged 5.8. Um, the highest average rating was for performance measurement for the organization as a whole. And the lowest rating was for resource management. And one thing I noticed too, going through all of these results too, and this was pretty consistent, is that the leadership ratings were often quite a bit higher than the management ratings. And uh, well, I can't really comment so much on, on the one staff rating because there's only one, one respondent there. But, um, you know, for the others, that was a general uh, finding that I, I noticed. Here, we're going to take a look at each one of the key management areas so you can appreciate the practices and the, the ratings on the practices. In the, in the governance area, we see this uh, one practice, um, ensuring the governance system meets legal, financial, ethical, and reporting obligations is the highest rated practice, which is great because this is the one practice that is applicable to both micro size and larger size uh, organizations. <clears throat> but a little bit of work needs to be done on communicating that governance policy and strategy to stakeholders. Here's another comment uh, from India small size business in the professional scientific and technical activities area. And looks like they are strong in the governance policy area, but they're, they're thinking, gee, there might be an opportunity to delegate to lower levels uh, and monitor outcomes. In the leadership area, uh, overall rating of 2.4 and the highest uh, practice was promoting teamwork. Um, followed by demonstrating commitment to excellence and participating in events and, and removing barriers and participating in events. That's when leaders go to conferences and places where they learn and they can bring back uh, information to, uh, to, to share with the organization. Uh, but the lowest rating in this area was uh, on developing the strategic plan to guide towards a vision, reviewing it regularly linking uh, rewards and recognition to performance and demonstrating responsibility to the society and environment and learning from others, which is uh, benchmarking. Here's a comment from uh, a leader in the United States, this time from the nonprofit sector. And they're commenting that leadership is actively involved, which is fantastic and uh, the need to take a look, a more of an outward focus, not so much focusing on what's going on internally, but looking outside of themselves, which is pretty important. And there's lots of practices in the, in the framework that allow us to take a good look internally and externally. So it's good that that recognizing that. In the planning area, this uh, it, overall score of 2.7 and the highest rated practice was conducting a capability gap for resources. And the lowest was having contingency plans for unforeseen events. And um, and this, this is the lowest rating here is very similar to what we see on the world stage is, uh, you know, actually these two practices, the capability um, gap uh, analysis and contingency plans were actually quite low rated um, practices. So, uh, we're seeing in this particular group, you know, some strength in the capability gap analysis area, which is very interesting. And again, a comment from a medium sized uh, business in India in the education field. Strengths being consensus based uh, planning and opportunities and thinking they can be a bit better in, st in strategic uh, thinking or matters. On the customer side of things, you know, we see um, the uh, overall raging, rating of 2.8 and the highest rated practice were responding successfully to customer feedback, but the lowest rated were training and empower employees to be advocates for the customer. 
and using research to define and segment the customers. Um, and one thing I might mention is that when we take a look at all the practices in the, in the framework, they're in a bit of a chronological order. So if you're wondering, you know, where to start once you get, uh, you've done one of these assessments, you kind of want to start at the beginning, at the top, and work your way, way down. Um, and so this is, uh, keep, keep that in mind, so this doesn't become too overwhelming. And you'll notice that there's an asterisk uh, at the end of some of these, these statements. These are the practices that apply to micro size organizations. And so uh, some are not applicable until organizations are a little bit uh, larger. Here's a memorable comment from the United States, from the nonprofit sector, having hands-on experience with customers, and, but there's an opportunity to speed up response and action when they receive uh, feedback from other customers. Now on the employee side, uh, this is a, an area that had an overall average rating of 2.3 and the highest rated practices were encouraging employees to be innovative, rewarding and recognizing their performance and recruiting and selecting employees for mutual success. But the lowest rated were determining training needs. So, you know, this is so important that people get training ju just in time for the work they're doing and training for the work they're going to be doing in the, in the future so they can be very valuable uh, to the organization and they can progress through their career. Here's a comment from India, from a leader, from a small size organization. Great to see they've got this people first approach and the opportunity of course, to encourage this growth mindset amongst the employees. And I must say, when an organization goes uh, about implementing an excellence model, they automatically <laughs> develop this growth mindset amongst the employees. Um, it's, uh, it's something that really you know, transpires over, over time and strengthens uh, because there's so many practices that lend themselves well to developing this. Here's the work processes side of things, overall average rating of 2.5 and the highest rated practices were designing and documenting the key processes, which we see right at the top there and also communicating changes to process to the people that touch that process. And the lowest rated was using external data to compare performance, which is benchmarking. And a comment, um, from the United States, from a micro size organization in the financial and insurance sector that they've experienced in, in this area and they're, and they're prioritizing, you know, certain aspects of, uh, of, of work processes. On the suppliers and partners uh, end of things, an overall rating of three and the highest rated practices were developing win-win arrangements with suppliers and partners and sharing information that links to plans. And, and the lowest rated was involving those suppliers and partners in the development of social and environmental standards. And the comment, again, from a small size business uh, in India, how they're really collaborating with their vendors and, and the opportunity that they see is to move towards more sustainable business practices. On the resource management end of things, um, overall rating of two and the highest rated practices were defining resource requirements and developing a strategy to manage resources wisely. Whereas the lowest was uh, minimizing the adverse impact of the products and services on the community, which is um, pretty important these days when you, when you think about the consciousness uh, that there is towards you know, society, the uh, environment and, and so forth. Uh, so that, that's something that really uh, jumped out. And a comment from the resource management uh, area from the United States, a micro size uh, business where they have the skills and they're prioritizing uh, this particular area. As we look at continuous improvement, and this is where respondents take a step back and reflect on how they're doing in the key management areas. And they think about where they want to put some effort at strengthening a particular area. And every organization is different. You know, normally we find when we do assessments that an organization usually has two areas to work on where practices are a little lower and they need to roll up their sleeves and do some work. And so they 
work on one of those areas in year one, another one of those areas in year two. And so in this, um, in this particular uh, situation that we've got here, um, highest rating area was planning, uh, but the lowest rated area was governance. So an indication to do some work uh, in that area. And when we take a look at the way performance is being measured in each of these key management areas, um, we see a higher rating, uh, 2.8, which indicates that organizations are using, you know, somewhat of a balanced system of measurement. And the highest rated area was employee measures and the lowest rated area was leadership measures, which is very interesting. Um, especially when you think uh, about um, leadership giving high, higher ratings overall compared to management, uh, and yet they're not necessarily measuring how leadership is doing. So uh, that, that kind of jumped out at me. And finally, these are the performance measures that we use for the organization as a, as a whole. And it had an even higher rating at 3.1 on average. Uh, and the highest rated uh, measures were taking a look at how relevant the organization is in the marketplace, uh, its capability to manage change, uh, whether or not it's an organization that's a model of excellence, and customer loyalty, whereas the lower rated measures were meeting stakeholder objectives, the quality of products and services and employee satisfaction. And I might just mention here that there's four measures that are applicable to micro size organizations. And two of those are quality and employee satisfaction. And the other ones are, are the um, customer satisfaction and financial performance. So normally we like to see that all four of those are relatively high rated because that's a good place to start when you're measuring you know, performance for the organization as a whole. Uh, and larger organizations, of course, they, they maybe add a few more measures on as, as time goes, goes on. So these are, these are indeed interesting results. But again, we have to think about the fact there's only 10 respondents here. So some co a comment with regards to continuous improvement and performance measurement in India from a medium-sized organization and education. They're talking about the good feedback system that they have. And the, the opportunity is to you know, pursue more initiatives, improvement initiatives. Don't take on too much, but you know, work on you know, a number of things at a time. And we always like to... Uh, suggest that leadership assign things out to employees or teams so that everybody's engaged in initiatives uh, and and uh, that helps with growing that growth growth mindset. So as you as we take a look at the these overall aggregate ratings and for the 10 pace members versus the world, we see that they're they're a little bit lower, but you know that's okay. I mean every organization has to has to start somewhere. And, you know, most of these ratings tell us that these organizations are, are just beginning or off to a good start, uh, which is great. There was really only one respondent that I noticed that was a little bit more high performing. But this just kind of is a, a good comparison. And, you know, in addition to organizations, you know, working on their own uh, performance and improving it, you know, year by year, it's often good to take a look at how you compare to others and also to, to take a look at the ideas and suggestions your employees have for performing better in certain areas, testing those out. They indeed uh, often contribute to improvement and also taking a look outside of yourself to high performers. Gee, what can we learn from them in order to improve our performance? So as you as you take a look at, at these ratings, both the pace ratings and the world ratings, I'm I'm wondering what you're thinking about how your own organization would fare uh, with regards to uh, to performance. If if you can put some uh, comments in the chat, it would be interesting for Rafe to take a look and maybe provide some feedback on on what people are are saying. And if I, I'll just, I'll just keep going ahead and feel free to interrupt me, Rafe, if you, if you kind of get a sense of what people are, are saying in the, in the chat. Absolutely. Um, okay, good. 
So everyone feel free to, you know, enter your comments, thoughts, yeah. and we'll, I'll share them with Dawn. Yeah. Yeah, it's always interesting when people sit back and reflect on, gee, how would my organization be doing? And perhaps some of you have completed the assessment uh, um, and uh, others, you know, are encouraged to do so. Um, it'd be really great to get a good sample size here and be able to circle back and, and report for, a you know, a, a stronger, uh, sa larger sample size. But uh, this is, it's always interesting to discuss these results. It's... Um, whether it's an individual organization basis or for a small group, a larger group, and, and take, you know, consider the world uh, ratings that we, we have right now. Um, is there anything in the, in the chat there, Rafe, that you want to report back? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. But don't be shy, everybody. Please uh, uh -oh. again, share your thoughts. Okay. I'll just maybe, I'll can't move on. I've just got a few more slides before we open it up to have, a, a conversation, some question and answer, or or some examples uh, from that the audience wants to share. But I just want to talk a little bit about leveraging results. Is that you know when you do take a look at at the the excellence model and you self assess against it. This is got broad application because you know any size or type of organization can use an excellence model to their advantage. There's many, many benefits and a huge return on investment um, that ensues. Uh, and you can, you can get your leaders and managers engaged, uh, people across uh, industry sectors and different types of professions. I always like to, to take a look at, through the lens of individuals, let's say when we do this in an organization and certain of those professionals, they, they, they could be in the finance area, operations, human resources, marketing, they each kind of look through a different lens and, and their, their ratings and open-ended comments are so valuable. But it's, it's something that everybody can, can get involved in and different types of organizations like educational institutions and industry sector associations and their members, even countries can take a look at, gee, how's our country doing? Uh, and we've got about 20 countries that have really been high responding on our index. And it really gives a view to what's going well and what needs to improve. And this informs economic development efforts with industry sector associations. It informs the kind of training programs they might want to provide to help their members perform better and address issues that are keeping them up at night. Educational institutions, can they're there to help train the future workforce and and they can take a look at the results for, for their country and, and be better informed about the kind of courses they might want to provide to their students or to their alumni. Uh, and, and same with, you know, organizations, leaders and managers. I mean, this sort of thing provides a really great leadership development program for people that want to make their way up the ladder to know more about what's common to high performing organizations and, and how to implement it because as they rise up the ladder, they're in charge of uh, helping to do that and to achieve good results. So huge application here. And it's simple process, you know, is you, you take a look at an organization and their strategic imperatives and what they want to accomplish over, over time. You facilitate an orientation session that might be about two hours or a longer training session that might be a day and involves the assessment. Um, but this is just to orient people to the assessment so they know how best to fill it out. And they know it's confidential. They'll understand about the rating scales and they'll understand about the open-ended comments so they can, they can participate in this exercise really, really well. And organizations like my business was, is there to work to conduct an in-person or an online assessment uh, and prepare a feedback report that says, hey, here's your ratings, here's your open-ended comments, here's the, the low-rated practices and an action plan for each one of them to help strengthen it. And this becomes a game plan for then usually the next three years 
because you're not going to try to do it all at once. You're going to assign things out and you're going to work at things year after year after year. Now, on average, most organizations can make a lot of progress over a three year period. They build on what they're already doing quite well. They address the opportunities for improvement. They get all their employees involved. So, you know, individual employees or teams are working on these action plans. Uh, and then, you know, we're here to provide support as required if, if uh, needed. Some organizations have a lot of talent within, so they're perfectly capable of, you know, running on their own. But we also, as, as an organization is <clears throat> doing this sort of work, we really encourage leaders to compare how their organization is doing to others within or outside your industry sector. You know, do some benchmarking so you can learn from high performers uh, and <clears throat> take a look at what those high performers are doing. It could be individual practices, things that they're particularly good at, um, and, and take a look at these best-in-class uh, organizations because you always learn a lot. And I, I think, too, you really want to tap your employees in terms of their ideas and suggestions and innovative thinking because that is where an awful lot of improvement uh, will result. So it um, that's a wealth of, of information there on the actions that need to be taken. So you can see how this kind of formula for sex as really gets everybody engaged and involved and helps develop that Im improvement mindset or growth mindset and, and working together as a team to really get that organization to, to strengthen and perform better. And when you think about it, if there's uh, a lot of organizations in a particular area, industry sector or a region or a country, we see more and more high performing organizations. I mean, those organizations buy goods and services, hire employees, make contributions to the community in terms of volunteer hours and donations. Um, this good work all serves to strengthen the economy, establish stronger trade relationships, confidence in doing business with that sector or a country, and uh, trickles all this good work trickles through to a better uh, resident quality of life. So it's extremely powerful. And we've got some great examples out there. I think about the example that Singapore provided uh, years ago, you know, moving from a third world country to a first world country in a space of about 30 years, amazing work over, that's a relatively short period of time to come that distance. I take a look at the work that I've been involved in in the United Arab Emirates and I've had an absolute privilege of watching them, you know, start their journey um, and, and working with them from about 2017 to just this year. Oh my goodness sakes, there's been improvement that has been realized uh, with, the, with the government there that has just been noteworthy. And I'm trying to talk them into writing an article for our newsletter because I'm really proud of, uh, of their accomplishments and I, I want them to be able to share you know, uh, with, with others, what they've been doing. So, and this is possible with an industry sector, uh, a country, a region, you know, the, the kind of scope varies depending on what people want to do. And so now with that, I'll maybe turn it over to Rafe because we've got all these prizes that we're giving away today and, uh, and, uh, and ask Rafe to, t Rafe to tell us more about that. Sure. So we gave away, we're giving away 10 uh, registrations to uh, PACE's uh, annual conference that is on June 20th. And we have selected the, the winners. We will be in touch with them very shortly to notify those who, who have won. And thanks to those who participated in in the uh, uh, in the survey uh, and help us uh, get these results. Uh, and Dawn, was there something else? Yes, I, I wanted to pitch in too and offer uh, a prize for one of the respondents and just drawn at, at random. 
Uh, and so my, my prize is going to be spending an hour with them to discuss their confidential assessment results and just having a good conversation about what's going well, what needs to improve, um, how to go about that, uh, and, uh, and just answer any questions that they've got, you know, because there's always a lots of questions about uh, where do we go from here. So I'll be sharing with them a short uh, feedback report that, that provides a, a good visual of, of what's going well, what needs to improve, and then, and then talk about, you know, working towards strengthening the organization. So please to, please to do that. That's that's wonderful. It's a a win win, I think, for everyone who has participated in this yeah. survey and uh, uh, this, in this webinar. So we do have a question for you. Okay, I'm going to uh, stop sharing my screen now, so I can I can open it up here. Okay, and it's how can we guarantee successful benchmarking? Something that goes to the heart of this whole methodology. Well, there's a definite uh, process to follow when you do informal or formal benchmarking. And, and so it's really good to, you know, first of all, be aware of that. Um, we have, a, you know, an individual on our team, Dale Weeks, who is a real global benchmarking expert. And he's done a lot of that sort of work in the high performing organizations that he's been employed with, including Xerox, where that first the father of benchmarking worked and created benchmarking in the first place. So that was many, you know, decades ago now. But um, he's a he's a person that gives webinars so people understand more about it. Uh, he does workshops for people that want to dive in and learn more about the how to. And some of those people will be able to run on their own, and uh, others might say, "Gee, we might need a little help." Uh, and so he's he's a, a person on our team that uh, works with with others to do projects and has uh, has been involved in in uh, quite a few things, you know, globally. So number one, I think it's really important that people understand what benchmarking is and how to go about it so they, they do it well um, with or without, you know, an external uh, consultant. Great. And if anyone... Thank you for that. And if anyone else has any more questions, feel free to enter them in the chat box or unmute yourself. Um, I'm, Rafe, I've, I've got one general question. Uh, and it relates to uh, getting employees to make their goals the same as the organization's goals. Mm -hmm. uh, I've I, I shared an office suite with an executive recruiting firm for 30 some years and become pretty much aware that a lot of the people going for high levels are looking at what they can get out of their job, not necessarily what they can contribute. And you've got a churning group of those people coming through an organization. It just I'm just interested in your thoughts on how you get that group of people who's interested in what's in it for me. Yeah to get involved in what's in it for this organization, especially since I might not be here when we get to the end of the line. Right. And that that's the whole principle of alignment. Mm -hmm. And you've, you've really got to work with them employees on their orientation or, you know, over the years so that they really understand the strategic plan for the organization. You know, what is that organization aiming for? Where does it want to be in the desired future? But they understand too, the mission of the organization, the day-to-day, -day, why are we here, the business plan, this is what we're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, uh, and then that what you're doing in terms of goals and objectives has to be cascaded through the organization. You know, it's involved, it touches the other plans that an organization might have, like human resources mm -hmm. plan, financial plan, marketing plan. Um, it also touches your work processes that you undertake um, and your individual employees and their performance plan. Mm -hmm. And so when people see the way things are structured, what's planned, what are the goals and objectives, how are we measuring performance? Uh, and then they see how that is cascaded down to their own individual performance plan. You know, here's what you're here to do and here's what you should be aspiring for and, and, these, these measures are giving us feedback on how your, your contributions are, are faring. That really 
registers it uh, with employees and um and and makes it more meaningful to them and i might say that most organizations that i've worked with they just don't do this they don't have these conversations with their employees mm -hmm. and then lots of times they we find they found out find out when they're doing an assessment the employees don't even know about the business plan you know, it's a wake up call. And sometimes organizations, they not, don't even have a strategic plan. So, wow, they got to, they got to, you know, spend a little bit of, uh, of time on that. But you should have this really good alignment. So this line of sight from your strategic plan to your business plan, to your work processes, to your employees and the way you're measuring performance. And everybody's got to really understand how that all flows. And, uh, and that indeed makes this meaningful to them. Also, when you invite employees to provide their ideas and suggestions about how to improve performance, who knows the work that that's being done better than the employees doing it? And so when they're invited to provide their ideas and suggestions and see that they indeed contribute to improvement, well, that's pretty motivating too, right? Mm -hmm. And organizations, if they're, you know, inviting uh, innovative uh, uh, ideas from their employees too. It's another way to engage people. People get pretty excited uh, about contributing to the organization. And when you get them involved in these action plans, the things that need to be done, there's such pride in the work that they do. And I, I've seen it um, when we do this sort of thing and things are assigned out to leaders, managers, staff, uh, people, everybody does really great work. And they get they make some progress and they're celebrated uh, for it, and so that just uh, it, it kind of it gives people a very much uh, a better understanding of why they're there, and and the what's in it for them. A question I think is is answered because your reward and recognition system is is there to re positively reinforce their work. Do you know? And who doesn't like to be rewarded and recognized, right? Mm -hmm. So in your leadership too, there's a practice there that uh, speaks to tying leadership, rewards and recognition to organizational performance too. It's not just about, you know, mo moving your way up in the organization because of the time you've spent there. It's all about the work you've done and the contribution you've made. And uh, it's very well uh, aligned to your performance. So, this is what I love about excellence models is all these practices in there. It really gets everybody together working towards a common aim of strength in the organization and being part of that. And then employees can also be proud of the work that they're doing in their own particular department or, or role. And that is continually, um, you know, recognized and rewarded if, if they're doing a really great job. So there are a couple of comments, I think, that address that question that Doug just asked. Mm -hmm. And one is to create a bond between your people by involving them in group activities outside the box. Yeah. And then the other was personality tests and coaching one-on-one -on -one to understand their values and interests. Right. I guess to make sure they're aligned with, with those of the organization. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we have a couple other questions. Uh, how can an assessor evaluate the involvement of leadership when assessing any entity? Well, in the um, as you as you take a look at uh, to your improvement initiatives, you just take a look at where leadership is involved, and uh, leadership is also you know really responsible for making it possible um, for these action plans to be assigned out for people to meet on a regular basis to take a look at progress. So, and they're and they're giving employees a little bit of time to do all of this, to work on their action plans, to be a part of these group meetings. Um, so that those are just some examples uh, along those lines of, of leadership involvement. And I think I referred to it uh, earlier about how important it is for leadership to be developing themselves and bringing that knowledge back uh, to the organization to help build skill with employees and uh, and learning from others, going out and speaking about the organization to, to others um, in the hopes of spreading goodwill, you know, and learning from that organization. It's uh, it, an example, a good example of that was uh, Delta Hotels and Resorts in Canada 
years ago, they used to give wonderful presentation to the people in the, in the hospitality and tourism sector. And they would talk about how they became a high performing organization and the things that they were doing and why they got more applications for employment than anyone else. And they had top results compared to everyone else in the industry sector. And everyone else was aspiring to be kind of be just like them. And instead of being competitive, what they would do is they would come out and speak to industry about their journey to excellence and how they were able to, you know, aspire to such high performance and, um, what I loved about their presentations, it wasn't just the general manager standing up there. He had people from all departments, from housekeeping, from front desk, from restaurant and so forth. They're all up there giving their part of the presentation, talking about that organization. And I just thought that was very powerful. And yes, you could have just one spokesperson, but when you see the whole, you know, representatives from across different departments getting up there and speaking, to their experience, that's pretty powerful. And their, their view about speaking to the industry about what they're doing, yes, they want to talk, tell their story, but it's a way of helping buoy up the whole industry. Please come join us. Let's become more high performing. Let's become a standout industry, uh, not only to, to residents, but visitors from afar. Right. And so it's, it's got uh, that aspect to it of building strength in a particular sector and the willingness to go out and help others. Great. We have time for one last question. And this, I think this last question is a great one to end it on. And it is, what are some common challenges or pitfalls that organizations face when pursuing organizational excellence and how do you recommend overcoming them? Okay, well, that's a good question. <laughs> the pitfalls, you know, I think, first of all, it starts with leadership. You have to have a leader that is committed to this and, and wanting to take it on and invite his, the employees to be, be part of the journey. So you have to have a real commitment from leadership and that leader has to, or the leadership team has to have a, a growth mindset and want to do this and convey that to the employees, invite them on the journey. Um, so that's where sometimes we, there will be uh, uh, challenges because leadership changes. You know, let's say a new CEO comes into the organization, they may not think about things the same way. And so that, that can be a challenge where the this quest for excellence, uh, it, it isn't as high a priority because maybe that leader wants to work on other things. But on the flip side of that, leaders can leave a great legacy because you know what? They want to be able to lead well. Um, they want to strengthen the organization. They might want to communicate back to a board of directors. Um, they want to be seen as a um, a model, a good role, role model in their community or, or region. Uh, and there's all sorts of wonderful legacies that leaders can, can leave as a result of doing this sort of work. And employees, they want leaders that will chart the course and show where they're going and how they're going to get there. And they want to be part of, of the journey. So that leadership component is really, really important. The other thing is anything like this uh, is, is a, a somewhat of a change initiative, you know, and you've always got in, in organizations, uh, a third of the people are gung ho and want to go forward and be involved in something like this. A third sit on the fence and kind of wait and see attitude and a third kind of dig your, their heels in because they don't want to change. And so that can be, you know, seem like a bit of a daunting challenge. But what we know works is you concentrate your effort on those that want to go forward and let those that are sitting on the fence eventually join. And you don't spend a, a lot of time on the group that's putting digging their heels in. Those people are likely going to leave the organization and, and you want to use your resources wisely uh, in terms of... Uh, of you know moving the the organization in the in the desirable direction and you got to have the right people on the bus
Great. And it's uh, one comment, I think just along the lines of what you just said, uh, with regard to emotional intelligence, and it's important that managers have that and it's, it be developed in, in within within them. I think we're pretty much out of time. So thank you, everybody, for participating. Uh, I'm sure Dawn would love you to take the survey if you haven't already. Yeah. Uh, and also... Uh, reach out to her if you have additional questions or want to be involved in her, her efforts. And then I want to remind everyone to check out PACE's annual conference. It's again, June 20th. There's more information regarding it uh, on our website. And uh, it's we have amazing speakers talking about amazing topics. And it'll be, it's well worth everyone's time to attend. So thank you, Dawn. It's been a great pleasure having you back again. Uh, and everyone else, have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.